Ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back. I hope you all had a lovely half term, or as lovely as it can be. At least your weather's been nice. I've been attempting to sunbathe, but still pale as ever. You all please know. So today we are back to literature, and we are focusing on the poem called Bayonet Charge, which you can find on page 36 of your anthology. Um, now, 10B1, I think you might have done this with Miss Spires, but I thought it wouldn't hurt to go over it anyway, and then both my year 10 groups are kind of on the same literature thing, which makes a lot more sense. So always good to get a second perspective, so please still watch the video, still do the work, add your annotations. If you don't have your anthology with you, please don't worry. Um, it does mean, though, that you might have to copy up the poem. Sad times, but it's a necessary evil because you're going to need this information for next year. So, we're going to explore this delightful image I'm going to write first to kind of really get into the poem, English natures. Then I'm going to give you a bit of context. I'll read you the poem, we'll spend a lot of time analysing it, and then I'll give you some consolidation tasks to do. All of these resources are available on both schools and teams, and because we all hate class notebook, I would like you to submit your work to the assignment section of teams because it makes a lot more sense for everyone and it's far more intuitive. And I can't cope with class notebook. So, that is today's plan. So, our big question, if you will, is does the soldier act like a human being or are they more like a machine in, in a cog or a cog in a machine? Half term brain. So, some key words you might want to think about is war disastrous, patriotic, heroism, sacrifice, bayonet, blank verse, or genre, movement, say jura. If you're not sure of any of those words, Google them. You have all the time. So, look at this image. Your kind of starter task, if you will, rather than doing a weekly retrieval quiz, is, in your opinion, which words best summarise this painting? And what sort of ideas, big ideas, are being explored in it? How do you describe the style? And what do you think today's poem will be about? So those of you that have already had a look at it, you might be better placed to answer these questions. But, but effectively, what I would just like you to do is is summarise this picture in three words. What does it make you think and how could it be summarised? So pause now if you have to. Right. So a bit about the context. Um, if you've got your anthologies, you'll see there's quite a bit of space around the poem because it's only three stanzas long. So I would jot some of this information down kind of around the outside, maybe in the bottom corner, something like that. So it's written by Ted Hughes and it's about World War One. Even though Ted Hughes didn't live then, um, he still wanted to explore it because his father was in the war um, and Ted Hughes kind of saw the effects of war on his father. Obviously now we recognise that as potential post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, but back then mental health wasn't talked about as it is now. So Hughes grew up in Yorkshire, which lost a lot of young men to the war. And he said that even when he was writing at the time of him writing this poem, the community still felt lost. Um, and he was inspired by the poetry of Wilfred Owen, he was the guy that wrote Exposure. Um, and, and that's kind of why he decided to write this poem. So I've emboldened the, the key points there. I would like you to jot them down. You do not need to write down everything. So pause it here if you need to. Okay. So this is the poem, which I'll read to you like it's story time. If you're someone that doesn't have your anthology, you might want to take this opportunity to write down those stanzas and obviously leave space around it so you can annotate. So suddenly he awoke and was running, roaring, roasting hot car feet, sweat heavy, stumbling across a field of clods towards a green hedge that dazzled with rifle fire, hearing bullets smacking the belly out of the air. He loved a rifle, mum's a smashed arm. The patriotic tear that had brimmed in his eyes, sweating like molten iron from the centre of his chest. Think of all of them then, he almost stopped. And what cold clockwork of the stars and the nations was he the hand pointing that second? He was running like a man who's jumped up in the dark and run, listening between his footfalls to the reason of his running, and his foot hung like statutory in mid stride. Then the shot slashed furrows struck a yellow hair that rolled like a flame and crawled in a threshing circle. Its mouth wide open silent, its eyes standing out. He plunged past with his bayonet towards the green hedge. King, honour, human dignity, etc., dropped like luxuries in a zone of alarm to get out of that blue crackling air, his terrors touching animals. So that's our poem. 
we're going to explore each stanza in quite a bit of detail. So I've got it here for me to copy it down. Okay, stanza one. So, the first thing, top left, this poem opens in media res, which means it's right in the middle of things. And I'd like you to annotate why you think you chose to open this poem like this. So, I think it's the the idea, we don't have any context, we don't even know it's a soldier, we've just kind of inferred that from things like rifle, um, pot khaki, obviously the title of the poem, but nevertheless it says the soldier was running. So we're quite disoriented, and I suppose he is trying to make us feel the same way that the soldier must be in this situation. Like, it, it's, it's sudden, it's uncontrolled, it's unpredictable. Um, equally, the poem has an irregular rhyme scheme, and all of you will say that to me in parrot fashion, it's probably to reflect the chaos of war, which is absolutely fine. If you can add anything more detail on that, even better. So, I would like you next to talk about the kind of violent and brutal words here. Um, so, maybe just focus on three. So, um, maybe smacking, smashed, molten even. Words that you think convey a sense of violence and do some single word analysis on them. So, really go into your AO2. I've just realised I'm talking really fast with my like talking to a huge box. Sorry, I'll pause for now. Okay. So next thing, any language devices. So alliteration, personification, massive bore. I'm not going to kind of point them all out to you because I think we've done loads of that. Um, equally, I'd rather spend some time talking to you about the meaning of the lines rather than technique. The examples are constantly saying, yeah, it's great if you can feature spot and say this is a simile, but if you can't say the effect of it, it's a waste of time. So that's why we're focusing on the meaning. Why Hughes decides to mention that the hedge is green? Um, what we'll see a lot in war poetry is that poets don't just focus on the effects of war on a man or on a community. It's also the devastating effects of war on nature as well. And we see a lot of natural imagery in this poem. Um, so if you're being snazzy, you might want to have a look through and, and highlight anything in the semantic field of nature and maybe juxtapose that with the semantic field of war and how the two are kind of conflicting like that. So pause it now. Um, and here, how does he use to humanise the soldier in the last line? And you've got this simile, sweating like water wine from the centre of his chest. It, it almost makes him sound robotic. Um, as I said earlier, like he's uh, a cog in part of a machine. And I suppose he's in is really pointing out the anonymity of the soldier. We don't know his name, we don't know anything about him. He's, he's almost cannon fodder. He's, he knows his role, and so many of the soldiers felt that way. Um, and on reflection, we kind of see that as well. Pause it if you need to. Okay, um, the poem is in free verse, so quite similar to this idea of an irregular rhythm. I suppose he's doing that to, to highlight the curse of war, but also the fast pace of it as well. Um, this first stanza seems really rushed, you get quite breathless reading it, and I think that's deliberate to, to mirror the soldier's sense of panic as well. And here, how does Hughes make the poem a microcosm for all the soldier's experiences? So which word in particular? Um, and that, a microcosm is, is almost like a tiny example of something that's on a wider scale. So. This is just one soldier, but Hughes is talking about all soldiers here. Um, I wonder if it's this idea of khaki, how you identify the soldiers and how, again, they're anonymized, they, they don't have individual identities. You might disagree, which is absolutely fine. Um, but those are the things I would like you to annotate in stanza one. You might notice some other things, which is absolutely fine. In fact, I'd, I'd encourage it. But at the bare minimum, you should have this sort of stuff written down. So pause it here if you need to, make those annotations, and then press play again when you're ready. Okay, stanza two. This like, it, it reflects a change of pace here. Everything slows down. It's almost a moment of quiet reflection in all the carnage. Um, 
And the poet uses an ensemble quite extensively, so the line is running over, there's, there's no end stops. Um, and I suppose it's almost to mimic that that dream like state where he's having the luxury of this this moment in time to to consider to consider things internally. Um, and Hughes emphasizes this with the use of the dash, it forces us to pause. So if you read it aloud, you're forced to stop as well. Um, and it makes us reflect too. And Hughes also uses a rhetorical question here to show that the soldier is kind of uncertain as to where he's running. And I suppose what Hughes is, is aiming at is not only does the soldier not really necessarily understand the point of war, but maybe Hughes is making a comment on the futility of war as a whole. Um, it's pointlessness. And again, we've got stage error, so of course, after mid stride. Um, so it, it kind of takes us back to the media where it's like he's back into the action. So the rest of the stanza is a pause. Um, he's, he's kind of presented as this rational, intelligent man, wondering how he got to this point in his life. But then he has no more time to think because he's back into the action. Um, and the sibilance is used here to try to mimic the, the sound of the bullets rushing through the air. Um, and finally, this, oh no, not finally, how this metaphor of stars and nations creates sense of authority, um, and you've got celestial imagery, so that's just imagery to do with stars and things like that. Um, and I suppose it, it kind of demonstrates that the soldier feels like he has no control of the situation, and it, it's almost linking to the idea of fate, like he will die at some point, he has no control, but also Hughes could maybe be criticising, like Owen, who's the only use of inspiration for all of this, criticising the people at home, the politicians, the armchair patriots, making all the decisions, but not actually getting involved themselves, which is why they're cold, they don't really understand. Um, and then, what does saturating mean? Google it if you're not sure, and then think about what he is suggesting. How does it give us the idea that this is somehow forced? Okay, pause it here if you have to. So final stanza, back into the action, and we've got this bird threshing, so it's called in a threshing circle. So threshing, a threshing circle is, if you've ever seen a field, it's when the field produce, what's that called? Crops? Where the crops have been like flattened in the circle. So again, you've got this agricultural imagery, Hughes highlighting the conflict between nature and war and the devastating effects of, the, of war on nature. Um, so again, you've got that agricultural imagery. And again, reminding us of the green hedge, so nature yet again. And then I'd like to think about what could the yellow hair be symbolic of? And I suppose you've got obviously nature, but also this kind of, there's this kind of vulnerable, innocent animal that isn't able to voice its concerns, isn't able to voice its terror, kind of like the soldier in the poem. We, we kind of see it as quite innocent, certainly very vulnerable. And then you've got the moon of extreme terror. It's almost quite dispersive imagery. The yellow hair is rolling like a flame, it's crawling, its mouth wide open, silent, its eyes standing out. It's quite graphic, and it's meant to make us feel uncomfortable because that's how soldiers feel in two. It's, he's talking about a hair, but really he's talking about any of these soldiers, any of these young boys that have been sent to war. Um, and again, you've got the idea of the futility of all the pointlessness of it, um, which links to this next point. So what's the soldier thing when he says, king, honour, human dignity, etc.? Is it panic? Is it fear? Is it frustration? Why is the soldier suddenly dismissive of these things? So king, honour, human dignity, etc. And this, this word here really diminishes the rest, like it's suddenly meaningless because he's just trying to survive. He's forgotten the point of why he's there, the, the ultimate cause. It's meaningless because his life is on the line now. And then here, what's the last line suggesting about soldiers' relations? So, this hair is touchy dynamite. So, is it that he's angry at being roped into it? Is it that he can't contain his emotions anymore? Is it that his life's about to expire? It's up to you. 
what do you think it is? There's one more slide after this, so pause here if you need to. Okay, and on to our consolidation slide. I would like you, being your Excel books or whatever you're using to write on at the moment, Google Documents, whatever, I would like you to make sure that you do at least one of each colour. If you want to do all of them, even better. But make sure you do one of each colour because it's really going to consolidate your understanding of the poem. Obviously, you've just done annotations, so it's really useful to have some sort of extended responses as well. So, that is Bayonet Judge. That is the poem for the week. I hope you're all well, enjoying the sun, missing your faces. Take care. Bye!